Yeah, so as Dean said, the first thing I'm going to do is just give you a very brief overview of the project that we're working on, um, myself and Jason are working on, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about an exhibition that's here in front of me. Um, so, Making the Future um, is a cross-border cultural programme which will empower people to use museum collections and archives to explore the past and create a powerful vision for the future. Um, and it brings together sort of three, they describe us as leading cultural organisations, um, from me, the Public Record Office, the Linen Hall Library and National Museums in Northern Ireland. And we're all led by the Nerve Centre that has offices in Derry, Londonderry and Belfast. Um, it's supported by 1.82 million euro of EU funding under the Peace Forward programme. And basically what it does is bringing together all of these organisations under nine different strands of work. And we're all looking at sort of the tagline, which is everyone has a voice, everyone has a story and everyone has a future. And it's looking at three things. We're obviously delving into the past, using archival collections and museum collections to look at the past, take the temperature of where we are now and see what our hopes and ambitions are for the future. Um, and we're working with participants from various different communities, cultural, religious backgrounds, social backgrounds, um, and we're doing it in lots of different ways. So as I said, there are nine different strands of work under this project, um, and the one that Jason um, in the Lynn Hall Library and myself and my colleague Laura here are working on together is Women in the Archives, and that's what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, and all of the other strands, um, Prony works on some of them, the Lynn Hall works on some of them, and National Museum of Northern Ireland work on some of them as well. Um, but it's Women in the Archives that brought Prony and the Lynn Hall Library together to work in partnership, and it's what we're going to talk about today. So, Women in the Archives, what is it all about? Um, we have an events programme. We've had a number of events already and we will have more um, between now and the end of March 2020. Um, they range from talks to tours, bus trips and things like that. And um, We have a huge community engagement programme underway at the minute as well. We're about halfway through. Um, we are ambitiously aiming to bring almost 500 people through our community engagement programmes. Um, and we do those in partnership between the Linda Hall Library and um, us here in Prony. And my colleague Laura, she's not here today because she is in Armagh working with 15 young people aged between 12 to 16 and they're on a filmmaking program all week and um, making films about um, Arma Jail so she's busy doing that so I think maybe I might have the easier job standing here talking to you guys today than um, up there with all those teenagers but um, and then exhibitions and that's really what Jason and I are going to talk to you about today and um, our two sister exhibitions and um, that we curated and launched um, in April earlier this year. There was one here in Prome, it was called In Her Words, and one in the Lynn Hall Library called Anonymous Was a Woman. And um, Parts of the two exhibitions have now combined, and they're on tour currently, um, and the exhibition is now just called Women in the Archives. It's currently on display in Derry Central Library, if you wanted to see the combined exhibition, um, before it moves to Strabag for September. And um, Parts of In Her Words are at the back of the room, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them yet. Um, the two smaller boards um, are going to different homes, so Marjorie Lyle's board is going to Portrush because that's where she was from, and Mary Austin's is hopefully going to start its tour in Conway Mill because it's about Melbourne. But the two of them have now combined. And just before I get started talking about in her words and how it was curated and what's in it, I'm just going to hopefully play you this YouTube video if it works. Um, and it's just going to give you a very quick oversight into what we actually we're doing with the two exhibitions. So. Fingers crossed. Hello, my name is Lindsay Gillespie and I work here at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, otherwise known as Prome. I'm an archivist and I was also the curator for this exhibition for Women in the Archives. Women in the Archives is a strand of the Making the Future project and it's a partnership between Prome and the London Hall Library. Women in the Archives is creating two exhibitions and also a huge community engagement programme. The core of our community engagement programme, we're li really looking into everyday stories we want to hear the stories of the many different things that women would have done throughout the centuries. Um, we're looking into everyday women as well. We're actually very interested in ordinary experiences at extraordinary times. It was lovely to be involved with the group. Just get involved and find out more about the history of the wonderful women of Belfast and what they were involved in. So I'm, I'm Jason Burke. I'm creator of the Anonymous Was a Woman exhibition. So the Anonymous Was a Woman exhibition is part of the Women in the Archives strand of 
the Make It the Future project, which is funded by Peace Corps and managed by SEUPB. The exhibition is rooted in a historical timeline, a women's history timeline. Quickly became clear that what I was actually doing was constructing a timeline of pioneering achievements, pioneering individuals, groundbreaking events in women's history. Women are often written out of history, and this archive attempts to write them back into history and give visibility of those strong stories from the past to inspire us as we move forward into the future. Three conversations with our community engagement participants, we decided that we wanted to tell the story of unseen and unheard of women. The women represented in this exhibition are just a small percentage of the women's stories held here in Prome. And the women's stories held here in Prome are just a small proportion of the women's history here in Northern Ireland. But what this exhibition aims to do is bring forward the stories of the women that we are able to find for the very first time. The exhibition then takes us through decades and centuries worth of fascinating events which are related to women's history. The exhibition then is separated into zones then above and beyond the exhibition. The zones allow us as the Linden Hall Library to try and display some of the artifacts, some of the rich collections that we have on the topic which is which is women and women in history. The zones reflect women in education, they reflect women in the workplace, women in politics. There's a zone on Marianne McCracken and the female connections to the Linden Hall Library and also a very interesting zone which is called In Her Words. Exhibition today as just incredible the hard work that went into it and there's great thanks goes to things like Jason and to Laura for their encouragement and for all of our hard work that's made this available today. Okay. I can relax a bit now that that worked <laughs> relatively smoothly for me. Um, so yeah so um, the exhibition that was here for me was called In Her Words um, and in her words really had a two-fold purpose and um, it was to dig out and bring forward hidden and previously unheard female voices from the archives um, but it also looked at letters and diaries as a medium to do this um, and I found um, as I was looking into letters and diaries um, some good quotes that sort of set the scene and um, there's one by Ellen Terry from the story of my life in 1908 and it says what is a diary? A document used to the person, useful to the person who keeps it, dull to the contemporary who reads it, and invaluable to the student centuries after who treasures it. And um, that's kind of exactly why we pick letters and diaries. Um, and I have another one here. It's from the 1st of January, 1900. Um, and it's a diary entry. It says, I begin today a new year and a new century full of anxiety and fear of what may be before us. Um, this didn't come from something in Prony, I wish that we had this, um, but this is actually from a diary of Queen Victoria. And we don't know if she would have been so candid um, if she was speaking publicly um, about anxiety and fear of, of a new year and a new century and how times were changing. Um, so while diaries of famous and notable people can give us an, offer us a deeper insight um, into their lives, um, diaries and letters are also where we can find women's experiences written um, in their own words. So around this time last year, just after we'd started this programme, um, Jason and myself and Laura were thinking about women in the archives, what it was asking of us, what it might mean to us. Um, the tagline of the entire Making the Future project is everyone has a story, everyone has a voice and everyone has a future. Um, and we felt that that was really relevant to our strand here, particularly through our exhibitions and community engagement programmes. And we're really wanting to look at three things. Um, we want to dig out as many voices from the past as we can that have been previously unheard and hidden. Um, and we want to take then a look at what it means to be a woman in 2019. And thirdly, look to the future and what histories we might be leaving behind to tell people in the future about what our lives are like. So through our earliest community engagement programmes, we had discussions with the participants about what they might like to see from an exhibition. Um, and what really came through was that they really did want to hear stories of ordinary women and um, women who would reflect the lives of their mothers, their grandmothers, their great grandmothers. They'd heard many times about the great and the good and landed estate families and women who were already famous and they wanted to hear more about ordinary lives and ordinary experiences that would reflect what their families might have looked like. So the big question then was well how am I going to do this? Um, historian and broadcaster Dr. Bethany Hughes is quoted as saying, it's the inconvenient truth that women have always been 50% of the population, but only occupy about 0.5% of recorded history. So I thought, I'm going to have my work cut out for me here to find enough stuff in here because 
women just don't appear um, in the written record in the same way that men do. Um, so what I had to do really in Promi, in order to, to do what the, the participants had asked of us and, and to bring out these stories we hadn't heard before, I had to dig in to collections and just go through them with a fine tooth comb. A lot of private collections here in Promi, um, I discarded any woman that was in any way famous. If I could Google them and find information out about them, they're right. Mm -hmm. If they've ever been in a Promi exhibition before, they're right. So that sort of helped me, I suppose, whittle it down a little bit. Um, I worked here in Promi for over six years and Diaries and letters have always been my most favourite part of any collection that I've worked on. Um, I'm probably the world's slowest cataloguer because I like to read everything, every line and every letter. Um, but I've always wanted to do something with them specifically, so this was a great opportunity. Um, and whether written by famous women or unknown women, um, letters and diaries are really captivating glimpses into the past. And to read somebody's own experiences in their own words, in their letters or their diaries, is really to sort of make a new friend. And then that built for me a labour of sort of love and heartbreak and um, while putting together this exhibition because I couldn't put everybody in and I have to start setting people aside and um, even though I felt like really connected with them reading their diaries and, and their letters but that's really how I, In Her Words was born and for In Her Words I would say nearly all of the women have one thing in common and that's when they put pen to paper 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago and um, I'm sure they never would have imagined that we would be standing here today talking about the words that they wrote, talking about what they tell us about the past. Um, these women didn't write to make history, they wrote for many other reasons, but they're so useful to us now, all this time later. So if you look at letters that I was able to dig out and include in the exhibition, um, the start of the exhibition looked at immigrant letters, and I picked out one in particular, Annie McCune. She's not a famous woman, I just knew her name because it was on the bottom of her letters, um, and she was writing from Miami back to Belfast um, and her description of life um, in Miami and the picture she sends of her home in Miami are just a world away from life here in Belfast in the early 1900s. Um, but Annie McKeown wasn't writing to make history or ever thinking that we would look at it and study it and see what she was saying. She was writing out of necessity and um, when you emigrated 150 years ago, 100 years ago, you were pretty much leaving for good. You would never be home again. You would probably never see your family again. It's totally different now. If you emigrate, you might say, oh, in six months I'll be home for a couple of weeks or I'll be home for someone's wedding or whatever. And um, You can Skype every day, keep up with life as it happens. As an immigrant, that just didn't happen 150 years ago. It was goodbye forever. Um, they're writing letters and trying to squeeze all the information that they can into letters. They have no other way of keeping in touch with the family they've left behind. So that's why we have hundreds, if not thousands, of immigrant letters here at Crony. It's because so many people did leave Ireland to go to the US, Canada, Australia and they wanted to keep in touch with their families and that is how we know what it was like to emigrate all those years ago. Then we have Martha Barr and Mary Austin. Mary Austin's panel is still at the back of the room and I found both of these sets of correspondence in, it's, um, in our Prime Minister's correspondence files actually in here. So these, both of these ladies had written um, to James Craig, the Prime Minister, in the 1920s and again they're not writing to make a political point, they're not writing to make a historical point, they're literally writing out of desperation. Martha Barr um, was young, she was only in her early 20s and so was her husband and her husband is dying. Um, he has pleurisy um, which she relates back to injuries that he sustained during the First World War. Um, she's been to the army, they say it's nothing to do with the service, they won't help her. And she has been out working in Stormont but has left her job because her husband is dying and she wants to stay at home with him in the last few months of his life. So she writes to James Craig asking for a bit of financial assistance just so that she can nurse her husband through the last few months of his life. She's happy enough to go back to work after that but she just needs something to keep them going. Um, so that's why she writes out of absolute desperation but it's a really poignant reflection on what life was like for women after the end of the First World War experiences had changed so much because the social landscape had changed <coughs> due to the massive loss in male life and a lot of men coming back injured and not coming back at all um, and Mar Martha Barr writes really really poignantly about what that has meant for her life um, and she writes a number of times to James Craig, there's more than one letter in her file and there's letters back to her and I was pleased to find out that she did get assistance and she was able to stay at home with her husband um, for the last few months of his life and her last letter is a thank you and she writes it after her husband has passed away. 
Mary Olsen is another character. So Mary Olsen is a mill worker and she describes herself as a, as a hard worker all her life. She currently lives with her sister. Um, I think she is 69 and her sister is 73 and she's writing to James Craig. Um, and they're feeling the effects of the depression in trade in the mills. So some of the mills are starting to close down and she can't always find work. And bear in mind at this point she's nearly 70 and her sister is in her 70s. And um, she says they've always been hard workers and never missed a day of work where it's been available. And she's writing to James Craig because she's seen an advert in the paper about public funds. And again, all she's asking is for a little bit of help until she can get back into work. She's not looking even to be look, like stop working and be looked after until she dies. She's only looking for a bit of help until she can get back to work. Um, I did a bit of outside research on Mary Austin, just looking through census records and things like that to see if I could find out more about her. And what I could tell was that she writes these letters in sort of the early 1920s. She has been the head of her household since at least 1901. Um, in 1901 she's living with her sister and her son and in 1911 she's just living with her sister. She writes multiple times to James Craig too and never mentions a son so I don't know if her son is still alive, he could have died during the war but he certainly doesn't seem to have anything to do with her life. Um, and his father, her husband, has been dead since at least, or dead or abandoned her at least before 1901. Um, so she's been on her own for a long time and she's a very strong woman, a very forthright woman. She says all the time, I'm not a beggar, I don't want to be. I like to work, I like to support myself, but things are getting harder. And she's ill as well, she has an abscess on her back and an abscess on her neck. And she's just looking for some help. But again, she can tell us a lot about how industrial change was affecting Belfast at this time, and particularly her as a woman who's self-supporting. Um, but she wasn't trying to, she was just writing. I'm sure she thought they'd just be thrown away eventually, like nobody would ever see them again. Um, but we can see them coming. We also looked at the collection of Nan Watson. So, Nan Watson is a really, really interesting woman. She was one of the earliest qualified doctors here in Northern Ireland and she was a military doctor during the Second World War. She was involved in lots of organisations, particularly women's organisations and big in the Girl Guides. Um, and Nan Watson can only be described as a hoarder. Her collection is huge. I don't think she ever, ever threw anything out. And her collection goes right from her school days um, in Victoria College and spans near enough her whole lifetime. So we've got little bits and pieces of diaries that she wrote as a teenager and letters that she wrote to her mum um, and all records that go through her time at Queen's and her time as a doctor and um, during the Second World War. She literally kept, I think, every single piece of information about everybody that she treated as well, which is really, really interesting. And she also had thousands and thousands of photographs but she doesn't label any of the photographs. So if you see the Nan Watson panel, there's a picture on the front. I think it's Nan Watson, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and because, despite the fact that she did all these great things, nobody knows about her. So you Google her. I can't find a picture of her on Google to see if the photographs I'm looking at are her or not. And um, I've narrowed it down. I would love someday for somebody to come along and say, yes, that definitely is Nan Watson. Or no, you're wrong. That's not Nan Watson. I know what she looked like. But Nan Watson, was a busy woman. She was doing a lot of stuff throughout her lifetime. And she writes a lot of letters, particularly to her mother and her friends, just so she can keep in touch with them, so she can tell them what she's up to. Um, again, she's not trying to write down, oh, I'm so wonderful, look at all these things I do, so people in the future will know. She's just saying, oh, mum, I was doing this, and oh, I'm so glad to hear this. And um, She's just writing them out of communication, but again, she tells us a lot about this life that she led um, during the time and all the things that she was achieving and the little bits, the way she was working away, and. It's largely been forgotten about, like people don't know who she is, but she did a lot, she was a really strong woman. Um, and then the final panel on, um, in her words, which is now on the travelling exhibition, was linked to the sister exhibition. The title of it was Anonymous Was a Woman, and it focused on letters that were written to Cara Friend in the 1980s. Um, Cara Friend was a befriending organisation for um, gays and lesbians in the, sort of the 1970s and the 1980s and um, it was largely aimed at men because um, they were fighting for decriminalisation of homosexuality and um, there was advice on if you get arrested or your house is raided and things like that and um, it was largely set up for men, you could write in or you could ring but they also did provide a service for women and um, I don't know what it says about their views on women that while it was illegal to be a homosexual man it was never illegal to be a lesbian and um, I don't know if they just didn't care about women or what women were doing, but it was never illegal to be a lesbian. But that didn't mean that lesbian women were fully accepted. They often weren't um, by their families or by their friends. They were maybe afraid to even come out to their family and friends. A lot of the letters say, like, 
you know, I've, I've just raised the, the subject of homosexuality in the house to see what people say and, and you know, then their, their parents maybe are just tearing it apart and then they think, oh gosh, I definitely can't tell them now then that, you know, that I'm a lesbian. And they're writing just to say, like, is there somewhere I can go where I can meet people who are like me or where I can find somewhere that I'll be accepted? And um, all of the letters that were written to Cara Friend were anonymised before they were ever sent to Crony, so all of the names um, and addresses were cut off the top and the bottom. So we don't know who sent them, but we don't need to know who sent them. It doesn't matter who these women were, it only matters how they felt. Um, and again, they're writing out of loneliness and desperation. They're not writing even to make a point about how they're being treated. They're just desperate to find somewhere to go where they can be themselves and talk to people who know how they feel. Um, and that's really where we've had to dig to find these stories. But once you find them, the words are so powerful, especially when they're written by someone they're not somebody else saying, oh well, uh, it was like this to be a lesbian because I read all these books. When you see it written in someone's own handwriting, it's in their own words, it, it gives you so much more of a deeper perspective. So then we also looked at diaries, and diaries are slightly different, and I think uh, Marjorie Lyle's panel is here at the back of the room, and Marjorie Lyle again is a woman who was very, very determined, and I first came across her diary just because I was looking for diaries written by women in the Prony catalogue, and that's just all I was doing at the start. And this one showed up, and I got it out, and I read it, and um, her diary, the particular one I was looking at, was written in 1973, and it's brilliant because on the one hand she's talking about, you know, a woman has taken over as the commander of the IRA, and further on down the page she's complaining about the price of her car insurance. So it's the balance between the kind of the big events that were going on here and then just the smaller events in her life. And we have lots of other places where we can look at, you know, IRA activity and what they were doing, what that meant for people. There's not many places where we might find out information about how much it cost to insure your car as a woman in 1973 and how she felt about it and how much it had gone up since last year. And so those, those little details are often just as important as the bigger ones. Um, and she starts her diary off with a fantastic quote, which is really why I liked it. And she says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and keep a diary again because I find it really inconvenient not to have a record of what happens. Memory alone is not an adequate guide, which I think is really key. It's why a lot of people keep diaries. But once I dug into Marjorie Lyle a little bit more, um, I find out what a powerhouse of woman she is too. Although again, if you Google her, you won't find anything out about her. She was the first qualified female insurance broker in Northern Ireland. At the time, she was the only one in Ireland. She set up her own workforce and at one point employed only women. Um, and she did lots of other things after she shut that down. Um, she was an author, a journalist, she did lots of different things in her life. And um, I'm just glad that I went looking for a picture of her actually and then I found out so much more about her from her collection. She is the only person that featured in the exhibition that I know that that is her up in the corner. She's the only one that I know that that's definitely her. Um, there are other diaries held in for me that were written for um, Lots of different reasons really, but they're all interested in their own right. And um, you'll see one there, Three Ulster Women in the Sinn Féin Rebellion. And this was written by Eva Chichester, who set off down to Dublin for a nice weekend with her friends. And then they used to rise and happen while she was there. So she writes her diary and she's a bit peeved because they had all these plans to go for lunch and <laughs> look around. And then the rebellion started and she wasn't too pleased about it. So, and she writes, I want to make an effort to write an account of the last six terrible days because I think we shall be glad afterwards to have done so. Um, and she writes down, blow by blow, how they experienced um, what she calls the Sinn Féin Rebellion, which we now call the Easter Rising. Um, and it's really amazing. And Eva Chichester was a woman, she was a Sunday school teacher and she lived in Newcastle. She was a prolific photographer too. But it's fantastic that she just happened to go down to Dublin for the weekend and then this happened and we get a blow by blow personal account of just a random woman on the streets of Dublin and how and um, she experienced it. Um, Emma Duffin's diaries are more famous in here. There's been books written about them. We've displayed them before. Um, Emma Duffin was a lad during the First World War and the Second World War, actually. Um, and all of her diaries are here. She deposited them here, which gave us a real first-hand account of what it was like to be a nurse during the First World War. And some parts of them are really, really gruesome. But it's, it's how she experienced it. She seemed to be a bit paved off. We've since found out from... Um, partnerships I've been able to do with Jason and things that he's been able to find out about Emma Duffin and her sisters that she was an artist but we had quite a nice life and then she went out there to be a nurse, it was gruesome, it was horrible and she really didn't like it and that come, really comes across in, in her diaries. And then we also have a copy of a woman called Moya Woodside who was writing for the Mass Observation Project and what she has is a first-hand account of the Blitz in Belfast in 1941 and um, she 
takes us through everything from the start to the end and hiding under the stairs and coming out to see the devastation and the bits of bodies all over the city. Um, now she was obviously taking part in the mass observations, that's why she's done it, she's not just done it because she feels like it, but at the same time it really does tell us a lot um, about what life was like during the Blitz um, in Belfast. So, what I will say is that the exhibition that was put together um, is not even a representation of everything that's held here in front of to do with women's history, it's only a little small taster. Um, I could have done an exhibition ten times the size um, if I'd had the time and the, the money and the space. Um, and even the women's histories that are held here in Prony that you can dig out are just a small representation of women's history in this part of the world. And there are lots of barriers as to why women were not able to leave their stories for whatever reason and why they don't make up the written record. Um, lack of access to education and literary issues meant that a lot of women maybe were not able to write letters and diaries. And also just a lot of other pressures on their time between working, like Mary Austin who worked really long hours, caring for their families, whether it be elderly family, children, partners who are ill, lots of other pressures on their time that they didn't have time to sit down, put pen to paper and write a really lengthy diary entry or write a big long letter. Um, and there's some things that we'll never be able to recover, but it is important that we do dig out what is there and bring it forward to give us a fuller picture of life here. So before I hand over to Jason then, um, there was just a few things that we really encourage people to think about um, at the end of the exhibition. As I said, it was twofold. It was to find these women's stories, where do we find them and what can they tell us? But it was also to look at, okay, diaries and letters is a great place that we've been able to find them. Who writes diaries and letters anymore? Very, very few people. It's just not happening anymore. Um, so what are we creating now that will tell our story for someone in a hundred years? Um, we're living our lives entirely differently now and in a lot of ways it's brilliant and Skype and WhatsApp and all of that make communication so much quicker and easier, so the emails. But where are they going? Can you even access emails that you wrote 10 years ago? Are we, are we thinking about how to save them? At least with diaries and letters you can fold them up, put them in the drawer and save for a fire or a flood so they're going to be there. You can bring them back out again and read them. It's not the same with digital content. So what are we creating and how are we going to look after it? And it's something for all of us to think about. Um, more than a third of the record, the three million records held here in Prony have come from private depositors and they're what we use the most to actually look back on history and people's experiences of it. And we're a bit frightened about what the future of that is going to be like if people are not thinking about how they're looking after the records that they're keeping and they're making all the time. So I would encourage you to Maybe start keeping a diary, you don't have to write it every day, just sometimes. <laughs> Send postcards when you go on holiday or write a letter to somebody that you care about. Um, I'm not asking you to give up Skype or WhatsApp or anything like that, they're brilliant, don't do that. But just occasionally, go a bit old school, put pen to paper, write it down, hold on to it. You'll be glad that you did. Um, so really in the words of Martin Luther, I would say if you want to change the world, pick up your pen and write. And while we not, might not be able to change the world anymore by writing, we will be able to safeguard our experiences if we just occasionally put pen to paper and look after it. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Jason, who will tell you about his exhibition. Okay, it seems, first of all, it seems like so long ago that we worked on this exhibition, or the exhibition was up, um, both here and at the Lennon Hall Library. Um, and we've been doing lots of amazing and interesting things since, so it's only been in the last few days that I've had a chance to reflect on the exhibition and, and try to put something together for this. And it was also hard to know what to talk about, and what because the, there's so much, there's so much in the exhibition, what to talk about, what to leave out, um, more importantly, but hopefully you'll stick with me anyway. Um, so for most of history, Anonymous was a woman, uh, wrote Virginia Woolf in an essay titled A Room of One's Own. Um, and so came the title of the sister exhibition uh, of the In Her Words, uh, which was held at the Linden Hall Library during April and May 2018. Uh, as I say, not that long ago, but it feels like a long time ago now. Uh, so we called the exhibition Anonymous was a woman, borrowed from that quote. Now, I would like to say that that quote, or the knowledge of that quote, came from my in-depth uh, reading of Virginia Woolf and her essays, but it didn't. Um, it came from one night being uh, at the Ulster Hall uh, to see Dan Snow, 
history guy, the historian and producer. Uh, I do the way you go to see a concert and sometimes you'll have some music while you're waiting for the concert to come on. Well Dan Snow, because this was a history show, he had historical quotes playing on a screen uh, for the audience. Um, and I was sitting there with my girlfriend who's here and I said, and that this quote came on the screen, Virginia Woolf, for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. And I said, that's the title of my exhibition in the Lynn Hall Library. And she said, is it? I said, nope, but it is now. <laughs> <laughs> and in many ways, that was the last, as we'll talk about, that was the last sort of piece of the jigsaw, uh, was the title, uh, which bound a lot of things together. But, but we'll talk about that uh, a little later. So, what was the exhibition about? Well, the Anonymous was a woman exhibition uh, charted a fascinating and decisive sequence of events. Uh, that have contributed to female equality and citizenship in Ireland and Northern Ireland. An historical timeline actually formed the spine of the exhibition, as well as thematic zones on each level, which allowed the Linen Hall Library to display some of the best discoveries from the collections. So in turn, the exhibition uh, was offered as a small contribution, I suppose, to the ongoing process that seeks to redress the anonymity of women in history. So how did I set about such a task? And to cut a very long story short, first and foremost, the Linen Hall Library is a library. Um, and so material at our disposal in terms of what could be physically displayed in the sense of an exhibition, I think, was uh, somewhat limited. Nevertheless, and as we'll hear a little later, the library does have a diverse uh, range of collections uh, to be explored. For example, the Theatre and Performing Arts collection. Uh, genealogy uh, and heraldry, uh, the Irish and local studies collection which has many different layers uh, within it um, and also the Northern Ireland political collection uh, which is unrivaled I think in the world in terms of documenting social and political history of Northern Ireland from 1966 onwards so there's no shortage of collections to explore but you know what were we looking for and, and what was this exhibition going to be about so what was required first and foremost, now bearing in mind I'd just been parachuted into the Lemon Hall Library specifically for this project. I'd been a member in the past, but in terms of my in-depth knowledge of the collections, it was virtually zero. Um, so I had to familiarise myself first and foremost with what was actually there. I'm still finding out, still making discoveries, as uh, also we will hear a little later. So what was required, I think from my point of view, was a re-evaluation actually of the collection using gender-tinted spectacles. Um, perhaps for the first time um, in the library. And so I began a process of trawling through these collections, often manually, shelf by shelf, box by box, title by title, just trying to figure out what was actually there. Um, and I'll show you some examples of some of the things that we came across. So it's really a mixture of postcards and, as I say, books, uh, but some of them are very old books and very interesting books. There's pamphlets, there's comic strips, right up to annual reports from the Garage Brigade, if that was a line of inquiry that we wanted to, to take, or these kind of obscure uh, periodicals, the Forget Me Not, there's a, sort of five or six of those I found in a brown envelope in a box, uh, you know, but on the face of it you search that in the catalogue, Forget Me Not, it doesn't necessarily uh, be clear that this is something which is going to include women, or it's going to have a woman on the, co woman on the cover, so you kind of have to go rummaging through the boxes and through uh, some of the archival boxes for this material. Other little gems which appeared, the annual report of the Belfast Prison Gate Mission for Women, 1st of May 1900. Now, the Prison Gate Mission for Women was set up in 1876 uh, by the Belfast Women's Temperance Association, which was founded in turn by Isabella Todd. So you've probably heard of, of Isabella Todd. Um, she was a pioneer of women's education. She founded the first suffrage movement in Ireland. Okay, so all these little links we were starting to find between different organisations and different pioneering women uh, from history. Now the objectives of the, Pel the Belfast Prison Gate Mission for Women were to provide a home and find employment for females discharged from prison and to quote, restore sobriety and morality to those women who have fallen into drunkenness. So no, it's only a very small book. Just examples again of some of the, these are quite big sort of newspaper periodical type things that you can find. Um, and it, to my mind, they've never really been consulted in any great depth. They're, they're filled with articles um, of women, of writers, of, of, of uh, poets and, and all sorts. Uh, you know, and all we're really seeing there is the cover without much time really to delve into these things. 
and the reports of the Orange Widows Fund. Okay, so um, what did the Orange Widows Fund do? You know, what, what were their activities? They're all they're all held uh, within these annual reports. Uh, so these are some of the things uh, that were found. And so it was clear to me that there was going to be no shortage of material um, from which to derive information. Um, based on the findings from the collections, we could have went, I suppose, in several different directions. Uh, but it was important, I think, to maintain a sense of perspective because the task was to come up with uh, an exhibition that wasn't to write a complete history of women's history in Ireland. Uh, okay, so we had to keep a sense of perspective and also be aware of the space which we had uh, which to utilise. So, saving the knowledge that the library's collections were a rich source of women's history, I approached the task in almost the same way that I would have approached uh, a history essay, I suppose, uh, which was to compile a timeline of events in order to get my own, own head around the topic and, and the subject, uh, to come up with some key themes that I would want to, to address and maybe some questions to try and answer. Uh, and then a, the, the dreaded sort of bibliography, or in this case I was calling it an inventory because it was an inventory of just material that, were, that was being found in the library and hope that we could slot it into the different themes which would emerge. Um, however, it was while compiling the timeline that the exhibition I think really began to take shape. Um, an historical timeline, as we've already said, formed the spine of the exhibition and it flowed seamlessly, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Lemon Hall Library, it flowed seamlessly through five floors of the modern Fountain Street extension. So if you come in from the Fountain Street door, up the stairwell, on the walls and on the glass panels was, was where the timeline uh, was situated. It charted a period of 226 years from the moment that Miss Catherine Clark became the first female member of the Belfast Library and Society for Promoting Knowledge, which we know today as the Lennon Hall Library. Um, and that was in 1782, up to the recent and historic referendum in the Republic of Ireland in 2018, uh, which repealed the Eighth Amendment and provided for abortion rights for women. So during this 226 year period, there, have be, there has been a radical shift in women's role in society. And in the main, this has been achieved by the gradual acquisition of rights through legislative changes and by the remarkable achievements of female pioneers. And for some, you might argue, that the struggle continues to this day. So the timeline idea then lent itself well to the exhibition space in the Linden Hall Library because it's effectively a stairwell, as we've talked about, uh, with five floors to be climbed. The timeline idea and the nature of the stairwell then fed this notion of a progression effect uh, for the timeline uh, and for the exhibition, i.e that to engage with the exhibition uh, was to go on a journey, um, a journey which would leave visitors feeling a sense of progress and achievement by the end of it. Okay, So I think women's history uh, and women's issues more generally are often understood in negative terms, uh, i.e. what has not been written uh, and what has not been researched um, and what legislation perhaps has not been passed uh, and I think these are for observations to make. However, I wanted this particular piece of women's history to be positive and to showcase what has been achieved in the past rather than beating ourselves up about what has not been achieved. Okay? And so the timeline became where possible. Um, a sequence of female firsts, pioneering women, groundbreaking events and momentous pieces of legislation often to be celebrated. Okay? So here's some examples of, of the timeline. Uh, beginning in 1788 with the foundation of uh, the Belfast Library and Society for Promoting Knowledge. Um, and I just picked out some, some bits and pieces at random. So 1916, you've got the core sisters from Belfast who are in Liberty Hall with James Connolly during the 1916 Rising. Uh, perhaps they were all, all amongst the first people to physically hold the, the proclamation they describe in their Bureau of Military History Witness Statements and bring it back to Belfast, okay? So that was a groundbreaking moment, I think. Then you've got Julia McMorrie, who becomes the first female councillor in Belfast, okay? Which there have been many more uh, since 1918. Obviously a key year for many different reasons, including Winifred Carney standing for election uh, in East Belfast, but then Constance Markovich then uh, being the first female elected to Westminster. So you can see the idea. It took you through many, a couple of centuries, many decades, 
1989, Baroness Mayblood becomes the first woman from Northern Ireland to be given a life peerage. And Baroness Mayblood attended uh, the launch of the exhibition. She took part in a really interesting discussion, uh, which we had on the launch night. Then on the left, for example, we have Samantha McComb, our present librarian, the first female to hold that position uh, in the history of the library, which I thought warranted a place on the timeline. Um, or as May Blood put it on the night you've joined us on the timeline of rebels, <laughs> she said to the librarian. And in 2016 you have um, Arlene Foster becoming the first female first minister uh, of Northern Ireland. So we, we, we touched on just, just briefly there and um, the, the first female members of the library and then we've got the first uh, librarian of the library. I wanted to say something about um, how I felt a sense that we were almost rewriting or recalibrating the library's history during this process because we tried to sort of bookend the timeline with the library's own history because that was another complicating factor. The library kind of has its own history amongst all of this, uh, which I wanted to try and weave uh, into it where possible. Uh, we were aware that in 1785 um, the rules had changed to permit females to become members of the library for the first time. So there was a time when women couldn't be members of the Linen Hall Library. Okay? Uh, but if you were to go on a tour very recently of the Linen Hall Library, you would have been told that Mary Ann McCracken was the first female member of the Linen Hall Library in 1798. It was only by going back through the minutes um, and the rules of the library that we discovered that that actually wasn't the case at all. Uh, I, I sat with the librarian, we went back through the minutes, the old minute books, right back to the 1700s and found, lo and behold, the first female member in 1792. So this, this, this predated the rule change by three years. Okay, and her name was Miss Catherine Clark. We'll probably never find anything more out about her because her name is so generic and, and, and sort of, uh, I don't want to say bland, but you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're to search for Catherine Clark, there's going to be millions of them, you're not going to find anything more about her, okay? Uh, but special in the hearts of the Linden Hall Library now because she was the first female like, uh, the first female member in 1792. So I think that the library had this idea of this progressive rule change in 1785. In actual fact, women were members three years before that, so they were actually reactionary to what was already happening. Uh, so more needs to be explored there. We found this out very late in the day uh, before the exhibition was launched and we were very keen to put it in. Now, the other curveball was that we were aware that the, in the, in the library's first catalogue in 1793 listed Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Okay, some of you may or may not be familiar with that book, but a very important book um, still is today for some feminists. Okay, uh, but the library had an original copy from 1790 of huge historical value and of also of huge financial value as well. The library were going to sell it at one point. Such was the uh, the money that was going to be life changing money that was going to be brought into the library. Uh, in the end, they didn't, thankfully, because we were able to then find it and display it then as part of the exhibition. But the fact that it appeared on the first catalogue in 1783 and the first female member was in 1782 made me think that there might be a connection there. Lo and behold, the librarian Samantha went back into the minutes with me. We had a look, and uh, thankfully, the early members of the library actually recorded books which were being ordered for the library's collection. Um, three weeks, as, as soon as three weeks after Miss Catherine Clark becomes the first member, an order is placed for Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women. So it's very clear to me uh, the influence that these early female members were having uh, on the library. So that's just by the by. And top left corner there is that copy of Mary Wollstonecraft's book still on display, actually, even though the exhibition is down, uh, these bits and pieces are still on display. Top right corner is the first catalogue from the library, 1783, which details or itemises that book. Bottom right hand corner, uh, we'll speak about the lady in question in just a second, but it's a, it's a book uh, which is signed by Mary Ann McCracken. So if you want to see Mary Ann McCracken's real signature, um, it's on that book. So as well as the timeline, uh, zones on each floor explore in more detail some of the themes which have emerged from the library's collections uh, during the course of the research. One zone uh, focused on Belfast social reformer Mary Ann McCracken, uh, who we've just mentioned, and her affiliation to the Lennon Hall Library. Uh, the library records show that on the 1st of November 1798, 
Mary Ann assumed the membership of her brother and sometime committee member of the library, Henry Joy McCracken, exe executed in July 1788. In actual fact, he owed money to the library whenever he was executed, and his family came not that long ago and did a bit of a PR stunt in the library where they cleared the debts. They were horrified that they owed the money and they cleared the debts. I think they came from America. But he was a committee member of, of, of the library uh, and Mary Ann assumed then his membership um, and, and you can see it in the, in the sort of members register, his name kind of crossed out and her name beside it. Okay. So women's experiences in education, work and politics were also dealt with in subsequent zones uh, and this is where I think the library's strengths were able to come to the fore in terms of its extensive, extensive collections and archives. The library's Northern Ireland political collection, which we have already mentioned, consists of over 350,000 items, including books, pamphlets, leaflets, posters, manifestos, press releases, newspapers, objects, balaclavas, battens, plastic bullets, keys, you name it, it's in there. Um, so from my point of view, where do, you start, where do you start looking for the women's history and all of that? It's, it's all there, but it's a mammoth task, and, that, and that's kind of what we were what we were facing and that's what I'm trying to get across to you. And this was a complete, still is a completely unique collection that's unrivaled throughout the world. Um, and within this vast collection it has been possible to unearth some historical gems which can help us to tell uh, the women's stories. Uh, the role of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, for example, um, is a narrative that is often obscured, I think, by the male-dominated versions of the peace process. Uh, yet the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition posters provide a fascinating insight into the role of women during this tempestuous period. So the Lynn Hall Library actually has the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition archive, which is, a, which is a rich source of information. Women's status in education and the workplace uh, has changed significantly uh, since the creation of the National School System in 1831, uh, which provided free elementary education for girls as well as boys. Significant advances for women's education were achieved in the 19th century by pioneering women such as Margaret Byers uh, and Isabella Todd, uh, who were determined to find a solution to the inadequacy of education for girls and women. Isabella Todd featured in the education er, in, in the exhibition. Uh, Margaret Byers, although she didn't feature directly, there were uh, smatterings of her. But she's very much one of these anonymous women, you might say. She is well known, but if you go to the city cemetery today, for example, she's known on her headstone uh, as the wife of the Reverend Byers. Um, so the, the anonymous theme, which we'll say in just a second, is, is a theme, uh, a thread that runs through uh, a lot of this. Just conscious of the time, I'm just going to move on for some of it. So maybe some of the highlights then of things that we found. The report of the Belfast Ladies Industrial School for Girls, 17th of March 1870. Okay, the Belfast Ladies Industrial School for Girls was situated on Frederick Street. And it's described as the first ragged school established in Ireland. Okay, so it's another one of our firsts. Um, despite um, a girls, despite being a girls' school, there were a number of boys who were permitted to attend. However, the school was managed, and you can see it from this, uh, by a committee of women. The report provides a good indication of the context in which the children attended the school by describing the fortunes of those children who left the school. Uh, and I quote, Ten went to the mill, four to service, uh, thirty were required at home, uh, their mothers being out at work, 14 left town, 6 went to other schools, 15 left from illness, 4 died, the remaining 49 through parents' carelessness. Um, there was no more elaboration on it. Presumably it was uh, administrative, they maybe hadn't filled the forms in or hadn't got them in in time or, or whatever, but it uh, gives you an idea of the type of things um, that they were up to. This was an interesting little one, the Universal Letter Writer from 1815. It's only a what we told of a book about that size. Almost afraid to touch it, it's so fragile, but one of our volunteers um, from the library, we have a really strong team of volunteers who take tours uh, in the library, but also spend their time around the library finding things that I can't find, basically. So if I'm looking for a book and I can't find it, I'll say, Jerry, can you go and find that? And he'll spend all day going and finding it for me. And those 
volunteers are invaluable because I could spend a week trying to find it and then never find it. From time to time, Jerry was bringing me bits and pieces, including this little small uh, universal letter writer, and I thought it spoke well to the In Her Words exhibition, which was being planned at the time. Um, as I say, from 15, it contains original and real life letters from men and women on love, courtship, and marriage. Um, and in, in the case of courtship, letters are featured from admiring gentlemen written to ladies in an attempt to gain their affection were the words that I used for the caption card. Okay? Um, responses from the ladies are then categorised as favourable and unfavourable uh, to the initial approach of the gentleman. And some of these, uh, I, don't, I don't know what other way to describe it, like a, like a modern day Dear Deirdre or something, or a, content, a Dear Deirdre of its time. I don't know what it is, but it's really, really fascinating to flick through and read. Uh, as I say, you can come to the library and you, you can have a look at that. Sappho Woman. See Richard's eyes lighting up there. This is taken on a life of its own. Oh, this is a lesbian comic book, a lesbian comic strip. Sappho Woman and the Greater Belfast Dykes. Now, this has been uh, both the bane of my life and also uh, an inspiration because we desperately wanted to use imagery from this comic strip in the exhibition and for some of our community engagement and stuff. But we don't own the rights to the imagery, okay? So we needed to track down the author. Now, the author when you open the inside of the book, was someone called Gay May Kincaid. <laughs> okay? Now, me being me, when you say it out loud, it's so obvious, it's a pseudonym. When you're reading it, it wasn't obvious, okay? So I spent ages looking for Gay May Kincaid. Could I find Gay May? No, I couldn't. Asked around everyone, asked Margaret Ward, who's a prominent uh, women's historian. This book was published in 1989, okay? The publisher long went out of business, so couldn't even track down the publisher. So said to Margaret Ward, any idea who Gay May Kincaid? There was a line of inquiry that Gay May Kincaid might have been somebody called Shauna from the Shankle. <laughs> so that was a line of inquiry at one stage. <laughs> Didn't materialise. Uh, through the power of the library's social media, we were able to put it out. We asked different organisations like uh, Rainbow Project, Car a Friend, uh, different organisations to put it out in their own social networks. Lo and behold, it took maybe a few days, but lo and behold, we did get there. Uh, tracked down a woman called Jill McKnight, who is alive and well in Greece, uh, but originally from uh, this part of the world. And so we, we managed to get the word to her. She came back to us. Um, she didn't know what all the fuss was about because I had, and must have felt like hundreds of people looking for her or looking for who it was. Um, so she came back to me in a bit of a panic. We, we got it sorted. She was very happy for us to use the imagery, but the, the, the bit that struck a chord with me was that she had no knowledge of the title of the exhibition, which was Anonymous Was a Woman. Um, I hadn't even got to that point of explaining what the exhibition was about, other than to say we would like to use your imagery. In the course of the conversation, she said, you know, Jason, um, it, uh, in, in that time, you know, in 1989, anonymity was vital for people like me writing books like this. And I thought, oh, this is all just falling into place in so many different ways. Uh, but from then, um, there's been events in the Lennon Hall Library which have been inspired by this comic book and, that, and the, the role of the comic in your own life, Richard. Uh, we had a community engagement uh, programme at the Fab Lab in, in Derry, Stroke London Derry, and somebody produced a, a very nice piece based on the, on the character. So it's kind of taken on a life of its own, and it's, it's definitely one of the most popular pieces um, of the exhibition and you can come to the library and you can get it out and you can have a look at it and see what all the fuss is about. This is one of the first pieces that I found, uh, I was conscious of time, this is one of the first pieces that I found in the library, uh, an original copy 1917, Sylvia Pankhurst, her thoughts on Easter week, her thoughts on the Easter rising, uh, it's an essay but uh, in bound form, 1917. When I, when I mentioned it to our deputy librarian, do you realise we have this? And she checked it up on the catalogue and she said, you know, Jason, that's available for people to take out. So quickly there was a block put on that because the thing's very fragile. It's original piece from 1917. But Sylvia Pankhurst's thoughts on the Easter Rising by all accounts is very much in favour of what was, what was going on in Dublin during Easter week. She was a friend of James Connolly, unlike her sister, uh, who was very much of a unionist uh, outlook on life. This was another interesting find. I was here last year at this very uh, event last year speaking about 
Ulster Unionists' attitudes to the female suffrage movement during the period of the Home Rule Crisis, and then subsequently we find this postcard in the Linen Hall Library's collection. So, without getting into the whole detail of it, this refers to a time when the Women's Social and Political Union, the militant wing, uh, the militant suffragettes, uh, went to Edward Carson's house uh, in Eaton Place in London. Uh, some of them chained themselves to the railings outside, and they held a protest because. Uh, in a nutshell, the Ulster Provisional Government had at one time alluded to the fact that women might have representation uh, in their Provisional Government in, in the event of Home Rule being passed. Uh, Edward Carson then reneges on this promise uh, and suffragettes then take the fight to him and they go to his door uh, awaiting to have, have a meeting and he spends all week avoiding them and saying that he's not well and he can't, he can't see them, etc. etc. He eventually brings them into the house uh, and tells them the news which they had feared, which was that he had reneged on the promise and that he couldn't deliver it because his party was split down the middle on the issue. Um, and he felt that the time was too uh, crucial during the home rule crisis to bring things like suffrage arguments into the home rule debate. So what happened was the suffragettes declared war on Ulster Unionism and they started digging up golf clubs, they started burning uh, big houses uh, in White Abbey for example. Uh, they start attacking UVF drill halls, they start breaking the windows of the old town hall. Um, and ironically, despite the fact that there are two armed paramilitary organisations um, in Ireland on the island at that time, the only violence really that was created at that time was by women. <laughs> and as well as that, I think it's obviously a satirical post postcard, but it anonymises who the women were. In fact, it goes further, it dehumanises them. It's making fun of them, and it's making fun of their campaign. Okay. So just to finish, um, I just wanted to say that great discoveries are still being made um, in the Linen Hall's collections. For example, featured in this edition of the Irish Summer magazine from 1911, we discovered this article by a lady called Catherine Sheehy titled, Why I Am a Suffragette. Now, Kathleen was the sister of Hannah Sheehy Scavington, who you may have heard of. She was also the mother of Conor Cruz O'Brien, who you've mm. probably heard of. Um, he was a cabinet minister in the Irish Republic for quite a period, and then he's a, a, an author and a historian in his own right. But the nature of the cataloguing system, um, not only at the library, but in other institutions, uh, means that if you were to search for Catholic, Kathleen Sheehy, you would never have turned that up. Uh, while on the face of it, a title like um, Irish Summer Magazine uh, would not necessarily suggest that you're going to find articles about suffragettes. Okay, so it poses some questions about how we actually access that information. However, discoveries like this, I think, prove that we've only just scratched the surface in terms of our understanding of what is in the Linden Hall's collections and also here at the Public Records Office, particularly where women's history is concerned. Uh, what we think we know about what is in the collections is really just a fraction of what is to be found. Um, I think I speak for both myself and Lindsay uh, when I say that we hope that these sister exhibitions have contributed in some way to a process that seeks to write women into history. We hope that it has raised challenging questions, uh, in some cases provided answers, uh, but perhaps most importantly we hope that it might inspire others to delve into the archives, either here at the Linen Hall, and to take forward that task of discovering these anonymous and unheard women from our past. Thank you very much.